It's my pleasure to welcome you. Thanks so much for making the time and joining us um, for what is not very often happening here is a seminar about genre films. And uh, there's two guests uh, joining us today. We have uh, Todd Brown from XYZ Studios joining us all the way from Canada uh, by, via Tromsø in Norway. <laughs> and uh, then we have Alexander Brunstel, who is from Ping Pong Films, uh, based both in Copenhagen and Malmö. I won't uh, go much further into those introductions because I think the gentlemen can talk for themselves. And uh, the way we are going to do the seminar today is that we're going to start with um, Todd, who has a vast amount of experience with genre films. We're going to talk about him, his role, um, his uh, background, um, what he's doing now, about the company XYZ, what kind of films they're acquiring, looking into, and also producing. And then we're also going to talk about what is genre. Um, it's quite interesting because I think, especially here in Denmark, we do have quite a narrow definition of genre. Um, and then we are going to look into uh, as well, so what is from a perspective of a buyer? Um, what is um, a buyer who deals with genre looking into what kind of films uh, they're scouting for? What, is, what are their expectations? What do they expect from the film? And what do they expect from you as producers, probably there's also some writers, directors here in um, the audience. And we're then going to switch to um, actually a concrete case, which is uh, a film called Divarium. It's an Irish film and a minor Danish co-production um, supported by DFI that was co-produced uh, by Alexander and that actually was packaged and sold by XYZ. And we're going to look into the whole story of Divarium that ended up actually being uh, shown in Cannes um, and this is uh, quite something because it's not very often that elevated horror is shown at an A festival. Mm -hmm. And after that, uh, we um, are going to ask you to ask questions. Hopefully you'll do that. And please, just one thing, um, because we've had so much interest from very different parts of um, the Danish kingdom, from both the Faroe Islands and Greenland, and actually also from further apart, actually from Norway and Sweden, um, we decided to record this session. We will only record the part where Todd and Alexander and I are engaged in a conversation and presentation. So we will not record the part of the, um, the questions. And uh, uh, we would also like ask you, um, never happens, but just in case, there's going to be one clip that's been shown that uh, please, if you are recording anything or taking photographs or something, just don't do it then when we say, so this is off the record, mm -hmm. because there are some clear instance things that, um, yeah. that Todd is going to refer to. Um, uh, we're going to stream it afterwards. We are going to post on Facebook when it's going to be streamed and shown. And just this part is, of course, not going to be shown there. So in case you have any friends, colleagues um, that couldn't join us, um, you're able to catch up and please just share when you see it. OK? But otherwise, with no further ado, Todd, you want to talk about yourself? <laughs> <laughs> um, hello, uh, my name is Todd Brown. Um, I am a partner in XYZ Films. We are an LA-based uh, production and sales company, uh, though I personally am Canadian and have declined to relocate. Uh, so all of my partners are in America. I'm in the Toronto area and spend far too much of my life on email and Skype and things like that, keeping in touch with everyone else. Um, and there's a few of you here that I know, and a whole lot of you that I don't, which um, hopefully I'm not boring. <laughs> so I wanted to t uh, start a little bit just with kind of my own background, because I think it really informs a lot of our approach uh, in terms of what we have done uh, as a company um, and the way XYZ functions. Because um, while there are certain things that we do that will be very familiar in the way that most kind of produce production companies and sales companies work, uh, we're also a little bit unusual in some of the underlying philosophy and, and kind of the targets and, and the way we've been, been looking at things uh, that comes from our, our own backgrounds and how we've meshed together. Um, for me personally, um, this, all of this is not my background or my education or my history. Uh, this is pretty literally a hobby that ate my life. Um, my, my actual education, um, I, I started with a scholarship in chemistry and ended with a degree in religious studies and most of another one in philosophy. Um, but through all of those years, uh, I grew up writing in the independent zine culture in North America, a lot about music, uh, and then eventually transfer, transitioned into writing about film. Um, and how old am I now? Uh, 14 years ago, 15 years ago, I launched a website 
that at the time was called Twitch uh, or a Twitch film. Uh, we covered a lot of international uh, and independent film across a very, very broad spectrum. Um, and when I started doing that, really I was only doing it for myself. I didn't expect it to be anything. Um, I'd been writing in some form or another since I was 16. You know, it was literally half of my life at that point. Um, and, and when I started the site, I ended up hitting a niche um, that, that nobody else was out there doing. Um, and part of how that happened um, is I just have a really fundamental belief that I don't believe in the distinction between high art and low art um, or pop culture and high culture. I think that's all bullshit. Um, you know, I, I believe very, very strongly that things are either good or not good based on what they are. And culture is just culture. Uh, culture is what a group of people do um, and who they are and what they engage in. And, and all of these other dis distinctions that we put on it are very artificial and imposed. Um, and so I was running this site that kind of reflected that and I was covering super art house documentary next to really grimy horror films uh, at the same time. And it, and it kind of stuck out to people. Um, and from that, I ended up spending uh, quite a lot of years doing quite a lot of festival programming. Um, uh, a few different events started reaching out to me uh, because they were having trouble finding the films that I was writing about. Uh, and, and that opened up some doors uh, that was dominantly, it, but not exclusively, in the genre film world. Um, I was the director of international programming at Fantastic Fest for 13 years. Um, in, in the US, uh, I programmed uh, for the Fantasia Festival in Montreal for five. Um, then I also, you know, I ran the, the film program at Canadian Music Week for a little while. I did the American Indies competition at the Black Knights for a little while, um, things like that. And in that world is how I met my partners uh, at, at XYZ. Um, through all of those years, Scandinavian film actually has a really, really key function for me um, and kind of an emotional connection for me. Um, I grew up about an hour north of Toronto um, in a really shitty blue collar town. Um, no arts or culture at all, <laughs> really. It, it was not a great place. Um, and when I kind of discovered the world outside of American film, uh, there were two real principal avenues that I, that I did. Uh, the first one for me was very much kind of Asian action film. It was the Shaw Brothers and Jackie Chan and John Woo um, and people either being punched or shot in really extravagant ways. Um, and the other one um, was really Lars von Trier and the Dogma 95 movement. Um, you know, I, I discovered Lars with Breaking the Waves, as I think most people outside of Europe did. Um, and there was something really raw and powerful in that that I thought was really interesting. Um, and then when the dogma movement happened, um, started paying attention to all of those directors. And when I started seeing certain writers showing up consistently or, or certain companies and certain people involved, kind of branching out and just finding as much as I could um, from those people and people that were connected. And, and what I walked into was a time here, I think, that was pretty unique. Um, and I was finding, one, Lars is a genre guy. Um, all the way through when you, when you go back to his history and where he started, that was something that was appealing to me. But then you also find people like Nicholas Reffin, who was just starting in that same period. Um, you know, I still think Pusher 2 and Bleeder are two of the best movies in particular ever made in this country. Um, you know, people like Christopher Bow, um, kind of in his early work, was very much playing with form and format. Uh, and things in very interesting ways. People like Anders Thomas Jensen, um, who was almost impossible to define what it is that he does, but is really, really interesting. Um, and, and that whole experience really opened uh, kind of a broad world for me. So this is an area that I've always paid a, paid a lot of attention to because I think there's a phenomenal amount of talent here uh, and an approach to story here that is, that is very, very interesting and really relevant. Um, kind of through the rest of the world. Um, and when I look back at it now, there's, there's an interview that I did um, kind of in my writing days um, that one quote in particular, it was um, that I look at it now and I realize, okay, that actually has changed 
and guided a lot of my thinking um, and has been hugely influential on me personally and what we do at XYZ. Um, it was in 2009 um, when Ole Barnadal was in the Toronto Film Festival with Deliver Us From Evil. Um, and, and we did an interview. I'm going to read the whole quote. It's about a paragraph. Um, but he says it much better than I can. And this really, really reflects and drives and has helped shape a lot of my own thinking. Um, and here, here is what Ola had to say. He said, I think in Scandinavian cinema, when I get together with younger directors in master classes or whatever, I always ask them, why would you want to show reality as reality? We're storytellers. It's a long tradition. A long tradition all the way back to sitting in the cave around the fire. The storyteller wasn't the guy that was telling the other guys around the fire about how to light a fire and how to go out and hunt. The storytelling is about how the fire came to earth thanks to a big god with wings. That's fantasy. Why would I want to make a film about a family sitting around the kitchen, ta kitchen talking about granddad's tumor, and then he dies and they go to the funeral and that's two hours? Why would I want to tell a story like that? Why, why not tell a story where granddad dies and then he flies out the window and disappears and you try to catch him. That's what storytelling is about. In my opinion, that is what all movie making is about, to put a crack in reality and show that the world is somehow bigger than just what you see. Because I don't believe in what I see. I don't believe in it. I think it's boring and I think it's crap and I think it's a lie. Even our communications are not as complex as we think. We think we can explain everything, but we cannot explain even one third of what we have going on in our minds. Fiction is about shelving reality, and by doing that, ultimately finding reality. Um, and I just thought it was really profound, um, you know, and something that I thought was really interesting and really reflected a lot of kind of my own thoughts about what is interesting about genre. Um, because as a company, we are very much a genre-focused company. I think we have an exceptionally broad definition um, of what we consider that to mean um, and why we've chosen to kind of get into that world. Um, and I think when you, when you go out and you find kind of a certain reaction against the idea of working in genre, it comes from a couple of places. Um, and the most common one is just, you know, that there's an artifice to genre. Um, you know, that, that it's somehow artificial and therefore it's somehow less art um, than, than, or somehow less true than if you are doing something that's more social realist. Um, and it can be, you know, a bad, there's a lot of really, really bad genre films. Um, there's also a lot of really bullshit art house drama. Um, you know, and, and to me that artifice is entirely the point of working in genre, because you can walk into a structure that's incredibly powerful, um, that has an allegorical framework and a narrative framework that people understand, and by working within that world and within that framework, you can take people places that they wouldn't otherwise be real necessarily willing to go. That you can take a very, very strong concept, you can take a message that is really rooted and you can package it in a way that it has mass appeal, um, you know, and actually address kind of some hard issues and some large issues in a way that is still going to draw an audience and be audience friendly, where if you were to do those things as a straight drama, people would feel like they were getting shouted at. Um, and so it, it finds this little bit of a balance. And that's a thing that we, that we really look for. Uh, XYZ as a company, we were founded in 2008. Um, the original roots of the company, uh, we had an exclusive one-year deal with Time Life, uh, the magazine company, uh, that we had exclusive access for that year to every article and all the research notes and all the materials uh, for every article ever written in any magazine that they had ever owned, um, just to mine for story content. Uh, that was the original roots of the company. We got a bunch of those movies made. There's still a couple of them that we're working on and trying to figure out where they live. Um, you know, and that was uh, my three partners, uh, Nate Balotin, Aram Terzakian, and Nick Spicer. They were the three founders, and then partway through that first year, they approached me about joining in uh, as well. Um, 
And, and a big part of the, the philosophy kind of coming in and why, why they wanted me to come in um, was just a recognition, you know, that there are parts of the American model and the general kind of North American, really market-driven, audience-driven way of making films that work incredibly well and that are invigorating and that are really exciting. And then there's other parts of it that clearly were already broken and were going to get worse. Um, we could already see kind of the end of the home video era coming um, and, and had ideas of what it meant. Um, you know, and at the same time, looking at the European system, or for me, the Canadian system, um, which is quite comparable to, to what you do here, also a very subsidy-based, art-based system, um, and looking at that and saying, okay, well, there are parts of this that are really great uh, and other parts of it that are really, really horribly broken. Um, and, and not reflective of the world that we live in. And what would happen if we could take the good bits of the American system and match them with the good bits of the European system uh, and hopefully cut out the stuff that doesn't work? Um, and that's been, been really the guiding principle um, in terms of how we structure the business and how we try to run things. And then from there, it's been about just really identifying strong emergent talent um, finding, in many cases, emerging markets uh, and places where people had not traditionally looked for films. Um, and in the perfect world, we've been trying to build towards being in a position where without the impersonal nature of a studio, um, we can offer all the same basic services that a studio would offer, um, not including distribution. We have no interest in distributing ourselves. Um, but from inception through to kind of getting to market, um, being part of that whole process all the way through, uh, making sure that it's a holistic process that involves the creators, that everybody is looking in the same direction, and that all the decisions that you're making are decisions that are designed to support your creative uh, as much as it possibly can be, um, and keep as much creative control in the hands of the creators as you possibly can. Um, through our history, we've worked with a, a lot of first and second time directors, which we're very proud of. We've worked with a lot of emergent producers, which we're proud of. Um, we're more proud of the fact that when you look at our, our filmography, you see those people tend to come back to us um, kind of over and over and over again. Um, those things are all, all, all very important. Um, can you mention some of the films and filmmakers you work with that you are yeah. working with again and again? Just yeah, so people uh, there's, there's a few of them. Um, the film that really built our reputation um, uh, in the early years is a martial arts film from Indonesia um, called The Raid. Um, and again, that's one of those cases where we went to a place where people just did not look there for films. Uh, Indonesia has a pretty good domestic film industry in terms of volume. Um, but has not traditionally exported at all. Um, and the writer-director of that was a Welsh guy um, who had married an Indonesian woman who was living in Jakarta uh, named Gareth Evans. Um, so with Gareth now, we actually were involved in the movie before The Raid, which is Marantau, then The Raid, then The Raid 2. Then he went off to write something for MRC that never got made and lost like three years of his professional life. Uh, to that project. Uh, then we made Apostle with him, uh, which is a Netflix original. Uh, it's a commissioned original for Netflix. Um, and then Gareth just went and he's just finished post on a TV series that he did for Sky and is writing a new film called Havoc that we're going to do with him in August. Um, so we'll be on to five features, six features with him at that point. Um, you know, there's an American duo. Uh, Aaron Moorhead and Justin Benson, we've done all four of their films with them in different capacities. Um, this film, Vivarium, um, is our second with the director, Lorcan, uh, and we're talking with him about multiple other projects right now. Um, and one of the things with these as well is, um, in many cases, like our relationship with Lorcan on the first film was very different than our relationship on the second. And the way that we worked with Gareth on his different films as well is all very, very different. Um, and, and a thing that I say a lot to people when I'm talking is we're kind of, we're kind of deliberately agnostic when it comes to business model. Um, there isn't a way of doing this. Um, 
and there isn't a thing that all projects need. Um, you know, especially right now where the market is just changing so quickly and the realities of how you make a film and release a film and how you access an audience are changing so quickly that as soon as you, I think, as soon as you have it in your head, this is the way you do it, this is the magic formula, this is the bullet, and kind of you build your system around that, um, in two years you're wrong. Uh, and, and you're completely obsolete and it won't be true anymore. Uh, and you're going to have to recreate it. So we very much take everything as it comes individually uh, and look at it and say, well, okay, what is it? How do you make it? Where is the audience? How do you get to that audience as cleanly as you can? And then where in that process would we add value? And, and we build a structure around that. Um, so while we do traditional international sales, and that's not a space that we're gonna move away from, um, we're also very aware that that traditional international sales model is a model that was effectively created in the late 1980s um, and we're just not in that world anymore. Um, and there are, there are a lot of kind of presuppositions in that model um, that just don't work for a lot of films now. Um, and if you try to force things into that, it's, it's, it's just not going to happen. Um, so we still do that, but we've also embraced digital very strongly. We've, we've produced eight original features for Netflix at this point. Um, and, and have a couple things in, in the line right now that look like they're going to be Netflix films. Um, you know, we, we've experimented at different times with financing things through blockchain, um, where the blockchain kind of vision has not kind of come into reality, but we did finance two films that way, um, <laughs> successfully. Um, you know, and, and, and a few different things. And so we're kind of always looking at where where things are moving and trying to adapt to that. But the point is that it's always in service of kind of who the creators are and what they want to do and where they want to go. And so it becomes a, about how do you plan to get there. Mm -hmm. um, and, then, and then within that, once you find your people, you're looking for the projects where it's like, um, to me, a conversation, I, I, another image that I use a lot is that when, I'm, when we're looking at a project and trying to figure out what it is and where it goes, um, the perfect thing for me is, is you try to find that line right where art and commerce kind of rub up against each other. Uh, and you want to be right on that line of friction where kind of the art side of your project is making the commerce a little bit uncomfortable. And the, and the commerce side is making the art side a little bit uncomfortable. Um, and you just kind of ride that line um, that you want to have kind of the depth um, and, and the artistic integrity. You want to have the voice of your creator. You want to have all those things. Uh, I mean, if you're doing this as a purely financial move, you're, it's, it's remarkably foolish. There's much easier ways to make money uh, than what any of us in this room do for a living. Um, but at the same time, if you get lost in the pure artistic concerns of it, um, I also believe very strongly that this is a medium that if you want to make art for yourself, um, you know, if you want to be that pure singular voice, um, I believe in the value of that, but I also believe you're in the wrong medium. Um, this just costs way too much money, uh, to do that. Um, you have to respect where the money is coming from and you have to respect the fact that this is a medium that only works if there's an audience. Um, and you have to be willing to meet those things somewhere. Um, and so you don't want to tip too far in that direction or else you become totally banal and boring uh, and, and it loses the value. Uh, you want to make things that are resonant and that are challenging to your audience, but you also need to respect the other side. And so it's finding that kind of balance point and that tipping point. Um, and that's very much how we approach genre and why we've ended up there, um, because it allows you to do those things. Um, and I want to, I've got a couple of trailers. They're, I should say before I show these things and talk about why I use these films as examples, uh, both of these are horror films. Um, I'm very aware of the pitfall of when we talk about being a genre company, most people tend to read that as, oh, you're Blumhouse, or, or you, make, you make horror films. Uh, we do make horror films, but it's actually the smallest segment of what we do uh, in, in terms of kind of where we land. Um, you know, kind of thriller, sci-fi, um, 
you know, we've done political thrillers, uh, lot, lots of different things. It's, it's about finding that element that's the hook. Um, but I'm going to show you a couple of things uh, and, then, um, and then talk about why each of those uh, was interesting and relevant to us. Uh, this first one, uh, this is a Canadian film that premiered at the Toronto Film Festival this year in the Midnight Madness section. Dispatch. Doris. I hear it, Chief. Today's been crazy. Really crazy. In Bui Nook. Aba Jimmy Machu Adijik. Surviving. Well, that was really fucked up. <laughs> so that's Blood Quantum. Um, that is the second feature film uh, by a writer director named Jeff Barnaby. Um, and actually is one of those guys that we've worked with repeatedly. Um, we were we sold North American rights on his previous film, Rhymes for Young Ghouls. Uh, and this project is one that we've been around for six years before it actually got made. Um, that first film that he did, Rhymes, he did specifically so that he could get the budget for this film. Um, and for us, the draw uh, and the power of it um, is, is being able to use those horror tropes, specifically zombie tropes, um, uh, for political allegory. Uh, the zombie subgenre is one in particular that was very, very, very much rooted in social commentary. Uh, that's where Romero was coming from in the original films uh, that he did. In his case, he was, he was attacking consumer culture. Uh, in this case, uh, Jeff, the writer-director, um, is a Mi'kmaq Indian. Um, he's native Canadian. He grew up on reservation in Quebec. Uh, this film is shot half on the reservation where he grew up. Um, and what he's doing with it, the premise of the film, is that there's a zombie outbreak that happens. It happens in the white population in the town just off res. Uh, and everybody quickly realizes uh, that the native population is immune. Uh, and so you end up in a scenario where you have a population of native Canadians who are surrounded by white people who want to eat them, um, with the surviving whites trying to force their way into the reservation to make the native people take care of them. Um, and I like, the, the allegory comes out pretty strong. Um, mm. Jeff, Jeff is a spectacularly angry human being. Um, and for very, very, very good reasons. Uh, he is one of the most articulate people I have ever met when it comes to talking about native rights issues uh, in, in Canada. Uh, the title of the film, uh, The Blood Quantum Laws, um, are actual laws that were instituted by the colonizing forces to define who was or was not native enough uh, to qualify for status. Um, and they are enormously racist. Uh, they were deliberately set up in a way that the native population would legally breed themselves out of existence um, and stop qualifying for anything. Um, our, 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 our history is horrible. Um, if Jeff had made a film um, about native rights, kind of of this tone as an art house movie, nobody would have watched it ever. Um, because he would have just been shouting at you for a very long time. Um, within this context, um, he ended up on national public radio uh, in Canada giving like hour long interviews talking about these issues. Um, talking about what it means to him as a native man to have a half caste native son. Actually his son is fully native, uh, but they are both different tribes. 
um, which is one of the specific things that the blood quantum laws excludes. Um, so his son right now is native enough. Um, if his son marries somebody outside of either of his parents' tribes, his children will legally no longer be indigenous, um, which is crazy. Um, and so Jeff was able to get into that on a level that was, it was, it reached an incredible audience. Um, what it also, what we also found is kind of from, from a market perspective, um, you know, trying to go out and sell an indigenous Canadian film that has no movie stars. I mean, there's, there are two white actors in this film, uh, in the entire thing. Um, trying to do that um, in any other context would be next to impossible. Uh, within this context, the established horror audience is super excited about this. The first time we released an image on Reddit, it immediately went to the first page with a, I think we ended up at about 75,000 upvotes in about 16 or 17 hours. Um, enormously embraced by the film community at large in the world. Um, even more interesting was to see the indigenous response to it, um, which was enormously, enormously positive. You know, one of the things I think we forget in certain times, um, especially, you know, like we're a company that's run, run by white, white guys um, from North America. I mean, we come from the position of privilege um, and it's very easy to forget that this medium we work in is one of the most dominant pop culture mediums that there is. It's enormously aspirational. You know, this is, this is a medium that people lock, lock into because it shows them visions of what their life can or could be. Um, and in this particular case, it went out to a community that never sees themselves as the heroes of their own stories. Um, you know, told from their own perspective, addressing the issues that dominate their lives. Um, and it was incredible uh, to see the way it was responded to uh, and, and the, way it was, the way people reacted within that community. Um, can I ask you a question? Because yeah. um, since we're recording this, amongst others, because there is a huge interest from Greenland. And uh, yeah. what is very interesting is that in Greenland, the films that are currently being produced, a lot of them are horror films. Mm -hmm. There's actually one director, Malik Kleist, who I think it's, he's by making his third horror film. And actually his first one was one of the biggest grossing films ever in uh, Greenland. Uh, they went around from one little place to the other um, with his producer and really did some grunt work there. And so there, there seems to be a lot of the same going on. So I think uh, just considering that there might be some people listening to us that will think this is like, Super interesting. How was that film financed? Did you go in with equity? Was the um, where, was this the one, Canadian funding? In this it? one was dominantly funded um, out of the Canadian system. Oh. Um, there's telefilm money in it. There's Sodec money in it. Uh, there's kind mm -hmm. of Canadian media pre-buys. Um, telefilm has a major push right now for representation because it has been overwhelmingly white male um, for a very long time. Mm -hmm. So Jeff came at a good moment in terms of maximizing that. Um, and then, yeah, we brought, uh, kind of the remaining money, but the actual market money it took to make this film about maybe 10% of the total budget. The rest of it was soft. Okay. Uh, rest of it came out of, uh, either local presale and, and kind of different forms of government money. Um, what was the budget level roughly? Uh, uh it was, Just roughly. uh, like four Canadian, four million Canadian. Okay. Um, and there's a, there's a wave of this coming out of Canada. There's actually a wave of indigenous kind of genre oriented film in general happening right now. Mm -hmm. Um, so this was the first big one in Canada right now in post-production. There's a movie called Slashback, which we are not involved in that we really want it to be, um, which is basically attack the block, um, way in the North with four Inuk 12 year old girls, uh, as the main characters. Um, and I've seen the footage that's, that's come back from that. And it's astounding. Um, and then we're in post right now on a film that we are involved in, um, which is the debut feature by Danis Goulet, who's a Cree woman um, who lives in Toronto. And that's um, the cheap pitch of it is that it's sort of indigenous children of men, uh, but using that post-apocalyptic children being removed from their parents to talk about um, the residential school system uh, in Canada, which 
for a shockingly long time was basically cultural genocide. It was it was government schools, church backed schools, forcibly removing children from native communities, um, taking them into boarding schools that were outside of their communities. They would be punished for speaking their own language. Um, it was it was a very deliberate policy of destroying the cultures um, and trying to trying to civilize or denative uh, the native population. Um, so she's using, again, that sort of apocalyptic, post-apocalyptic science fiction sort of structure uh, to talk about something that wasn't actually fully dismantled in Canada until the 1990s. Um, and how did you come across it? Is it because, of course, you're Canadian based, so yeah. you must have been on your radar? Yeah, Jeff, um, Jeff I knew from his short films. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and, uh, Dennis's film, we actually did, we produced uh, a film that her husband directed. Um, so we had a connection from that, uh, and her producers. And, and I think to a certain degree, we've just kind of gotten to be known mm. for this. This is a space that we like. Um, and, and, uh, the indigenous angle on it in particular is something that I feel personally very strongly about. Um, so I'm pretty actively looking for things like this. I'd like to hear more about this, the, the guy ingredient. Yeah, um, definitely. you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's something that I think it's important for, for people to kind of push on a little bit and, and, and be more active in giving voice to, to a broader range. Mm -hmm. Um, one, cause, cause philosophically, I think it's important. Um, and I'm just tired of seeing my own story all the time. Um, you know, there's, there's more in the world out there than that. Um, I'm going to show you one more. Can we switch off the lights, please? Wow. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that actually doesn't get into most of the horror stuff in that trailer. Uh, you don't get any of the ghost stuff in there. Um, so that's Under the Shadow. That's a, a, a British uh, Iranian director named Baba Kanvari. Uh, it's his debut feature. Um, his second feature was in both Sundance and Critics Week uh, this year uh, as well. Um, and again, this, this was one that you look at. We, uh, this was pitched to us kind of very early on. Uh, the producer reached out to us, um, who we hadn't known previously, but Lucan's an impressive guy. Uh, he made an impression. Um, and there's a ton of reasons why normally you wouldn't touch a movie like this. 
Um, I mean, it's a it's a Farsi language period set film uh, from a first time director. Uh, he'd been BAFTA nominated for one of his short films, but the short film looked nothing like that. It was very much a social realist sort of film. Um, but there was something on the page that was just really, really compelling. Um, and as we got into it, like that premiered at Sundance where it was, uh, uh, it played very, very strongly. Um, uh, we had an odd scenario with this one where somebody actually leaked a festival screener uh, into the sales market before the premiere, um, which normally is a horrible, horrible thing to have happen when you're, when you're selling and planning a launch of a film, uh, but it actually triggered a bidding fight. Um, you know, so we, we sold it earlier than we had intended to, um, but it, but it did quite well. Um, and it was a really interesting experience going through it and having been involved, um, kind of while the script was still in development. Um, you know, we were involved in a couple of rounds of notes and working with them. And one of the things that stood out through the production, I mean, you've just seen the trailer, so you know kind of tonally what that film is. Uh, for the first year and a half that we were around this movie, Babak never once referred to it as a horror film. Um, he specifically would not refer to it as a horror film. Um, and that did not change until he was in pre-production and actually planning out the ghost sequences and, and how they would be executed. Because what this film actually is, is a story about his mother. Um, because Babak's mother, uh, was an educated, leftist, um, non-religious uh, Iranian woman who was in the middle of medical school when the Cultural Revolution happened. Uh, and she was part of the protests, and she was part of everything, and she ended up on the wrong side of history and was literally told by the government, you will never be any of the things that you want to be. You are going to be a housewife. That is all you're going to be allowed to be. Um, and that's what this movie is about. A hundred percent. And again, if, if that were packaged as a social drama, um, and those, those movies have been made uh, and done quite well, I mean, it would be very powerful. Um, you know, it would play the art house circuit. Um, and it would probably have a really long run on the festival circuit. Um, and then it would be done uh, because there aren't distributors who put that movie out. Um, and so for him to tell that story in a way that could engage with audiences and kind of spread past that super specialized, very limited festival world, he needed to find a different package. Um, and, and this is the package that he found. Um, and, it, and it completely worked. Mm -hmm. What is interesting, though, is the, even if you say that he actually got a BAFTA for his short film, how did you stumble across this project? Because it, it, looking at your lineup... Um, yeah, his producer, his producer reached out to us cold. Mm. Um, and actually, in that film, won the BAFTA for the best, uh, best debut mm. film uh, in, <laughs> in its year. Um, so he's, he's been really recognized for it. But yeah, that was one of those cases where in many cases we're... Like we're quite proactive. I spent a lot of my year on the road and just kind of going to places and trying to figure out where emerging talent is. Um, this is one where they came to us. Um, we had no previous knowledge of Luke and his producer at all. Uh, this wasn't the project that we originally met on. Um, he had something completely different uh, that, that he had brought to us and was pitching to us. Um, and probably we'd known each other for, it was at least three months, maybe more like six months. Um, where he was like, you know, I've got this other thing that I think you might like. Um, and we never did actually the first, the film that we initially talked about has never been made. Um, it probably never will be made. Um, but this is, this is what came out of that relationship. Mm -hmm. And, uh, because you say like you met him somewhere and then. They reached out to you. Yeah, so it was in Berlin. In Berlin, yeah. yeah. So what kind of other kind of places that producers, directors, writers can kind of find you? Where do you... I mean, I know you go many places, but, yeah. <laughs> but where would you like scout for real if you're looking for something? Um, I mean, there's, there's a couple things that are kind of the immovable objects on the calendar. Um, I'm in Cannes and Berlin every year, absolutely 100%. Um, you know, they're, they're too big and too important to miss. Uh, I'm in Toronto every year because it's home. And again... 
it's 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 big and there's there's a lot of people there um and beyond that what i try to do um for for those really a level things those are generally the only ones that i really lock into and and do very consistently um, I'll go to Sundance in the years where there's something that I was directly hands-on involved with. Um, but like this year, we have multiple films that we're selling in Sundance, but I'm not going. Uh, those are not kind of my babies. I'm letting the sales guys uh, just kind of do their thing. Um, because it's, it's actually quite hard in that environment to get focused time mm -hmm. with people. And um, I try to find a lot of the events where um, they're kind of the more, they're the, the significant regional festivals. So a festival in a territory that's interesting, mm -hmm. um, but isn't necessarily drawing a ton of international, uh, sort of attention. Um, you know, so I was just in Tromso for this, this thing that the Norwegian Film Institute was putting on. It was very small, very focused. I prefer that because you can get, um, a, a lot of time with people, uh, and get a much better sense of kind of what they're about. Um. I spent a lot of time in South Africa in the last couple of years, last few years. That has been, um, like we had a moment where we were we were doing so just a bunch of catching up on boring admin work, um, and and logging things that we've been selling the previous little while. And I realized we had sold at least one South African film in each of the three previous years, and we had never actually looked at South Africa as a territory. Um, and I just said to my partner as well, if this is happening by accident, there's got to be something going on. Um, and it's hard to get to South Africa. It's, it's expensive. Um, so we took a block of my usual travel budget, and I did not go to Hong Kong that year. And I was like, I just want to go there and see what's happening. Um, and I went to the Durban Film Festival, which is their big industry festival. Um, and that first time I paid for, I, I bought my own badge, and I just... I was like, I just want to sit in the back of the room and find out what the conversations are um, and, and who's talking sense. Um, and then I've been back every year since then. They, they, they bring me down and put me on panels and things. But um, those things are interesting. Um, I do a lot of targeted co-production markets. Um, I'll be going to Frontier uh, after, um, after Berlin this year, where Alexander has been a part of Frontier a couple of times now, I believe. Um, you know, and that's a really, really strong uh, thing. And I actually help run a co-production market. My one, my one bit of freelancing that I do outside of XYZ anymore um, is I help run a co-production market in Macau, um, which is specifically for films that have both an Asian element and a Western element. We had, Lane has been there a couple times now. Um, and we had a Nicholas Reffin project there in the first year. Um, you know, so those sorts of environments. Um, I, I try to find people early. I think um, maybe uh, we should then just kind of uh, switch to our case mm -hmm. and talk a bit about the Varium. And uh, Alexander, would you like to tell us a bit about yourself and your company and how um, you came across uh, this Irish film? Yeah, uh, I'm Alexander Bronsted. I have a company called Ping Pong Film, which is based both in, in uh, Copenhagen and also in Malmö, Sweden. Uh, and how we came up around Vivarium is actually a little bit just to like elaborate on what you were saying about I met the the producer Brandon there I think it was five or six years ago on a co-production market at Frontiers and and we was there with, with I had one project here another one and we just had a beer together and then we had another and and just over the years we we used each other, or perhaps I used him more, just like ping pong ideas with and sending scripts and getting just like general feedback. So it was a very like kind of, when they had this project, it was, it was more like after we have tested a lot of other projects and all of a sudden this just, yeah, made sense to all of us. Uh, at that point, XYC was on board, uh, the Belgian co-producer, uh, Jean-Yves from Fracas was on board, and then, yeah, we came on board as well as, as a Danish uh, minor, minor co-producer. Um, so that, that was kind of like how that 
came around. Uh, it's maybe interesting yeah. to know a little bit about the companies that were involved in this because there is the Irish company uh, Fantastic Films. Mm -hmm. It's run by Brenda McCarthy and John McDonnell. And uh, it's uh, John has a back story of being a very, very good land producer. Yep. And uh, Brenda McCarthy uh, used to work at the Irish Film Board and he got so sick and tired of watching so many art house films that the moment he left, he, he uh, took action in education and writing scripts and wrote the script for the first film he produced. Mm. Um, which was quite successful and he kind of hit immediately, um, they both hit with films that were um, genre, they went directly mm. into horror, um, but actually um, those genre films they produced, they also immediately were selected for some of those um, genre festivals that are very established and they made a mark with them, so they were winning awards yeah. for the horror films they produced. And yourself, I mean, you have been uh, producing quite a number of, well not genre, well genre in the wider in sense. Way, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, because and so and Fracas, the company in Belgium, also has a very long track record. Mm -hmm. So here we are talking about people that a um, number of years ago started kind of immersing themselves in the kind of genre sector. Mm -hmm. So you've kind of you knew about each other. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think that is the most the best way to like start a relationship is because when you know somebody else, you also trust them, and then it wasn't perhaps sometimes like co-production is more like just to get some money. And of course, that's also why we did it and, and why we were on board. But they could easily have chosen somebody else to do it in Denmark. Because, but it just made sense that we start working together because we yeah, know each other. And it's a little bit the same like when, I mean, I think I actually know you longer than I know Brendan. Because we met at- We met at uh, fantastic, on LFO. Exactly, on a fantastic yeah. fest where you got my director drunk. Very professional, <laughs> but that was in a, yes, in a, in a, in a professional uh, <laughs> sort of kind of thing. Um, At that time, you had a. Should, a, should I explain the context? Yes. <laughs> uh, for the website, um, at that particular festival, um, I used to do an ongoing series of things at Fantastic Fest. Uh, I would only do it with directors whose English was not their first language. Um, and I would make people write drunk reviews of their own movies. So we had a set of rules. Um, you could choose your own liquor. It was either, had treats, yeah, it was either whiskey, vodka, or tequila. Yeah. <laughs> you had 15 minutes to drink five shots. And then you had half an hour to write a review of your own movie in your own language, explaining why it was the greatest movie ever made. And then whatever you wrote, I put into Google Translate. And whatever came out of Google Translate got published with no revisions allowed. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so we did. We, yeah, we did that to Antonio. Yeah, he was a good sport. <laughs> yeah. And and just um, Bavarian. Um, maybe we should show. Show the panel. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, because it's, uh, it's 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 quite an interesting pitch. It's basically the perfect couple looking for the perfect home, and getting into one of those. Uh, housing estates that have been built in many places, particularly actually in Ireland, and mm. that a lot of them got quite deserted after the big crash. Um, so everything is perfect, and then it just turns into... And this bit uh, is the bit that can't be recorded or streamed, because there's there's some uncleared music in the sales promo. This, this is the promo we made to sell it. It's not a public trailer. <laughs> So, can you tell a bit about the backstory? Like, when did you get the script? Um, what did you think? What did you think was interesting about this project? Yeah, um, for us, uh, uh, the main appeal was was the re was the director, uh, Lorcan Finnegan. Um, we had become aware of Lorcan with a short film he made called Foxes, mm -hmm. uh, that traveled really widely on the festival circuit, um, and then he. Um, he did his first feature on this super low budget grant program uh, that, um, you know, it was the Irish Film Board at the time at Screen Ireland now uh, that, that they did. And that film was called Without Name. Um, and, and we came on to sell that film uh, and built a relationship with him then. And this is uh, the same writer as well, a guy named Garrett Shanley. Um, and, and he was just, he, He's just, he's a really fascinating talent. He's a guy he makes, I mean, he's a very, very high level commercials director. Um, mm -hmm. He is certainly not making movies to make money. Um, any Anytime he takes time off to make a film, he is taking a very significant pay cut. Um, but he's got this real fascination um, 
With a lot of things. He's kind of really wrestling with, with a lot of things about what family means, what what kind of that idealized version of family means. Um, definitely, definitely has opinions about suburban living. Um, you know, that comes up repeatedly through his work. Um, and he's packaging it um, in ways that um, are constantly playing, or at least the, the three, those three principal things, foxes without name and this, all tap into uh, an element of Irish folklore, mm. um, but in a really weird, unusual way um, that I personally find fascinating, that he's going back to all these <laughs> traditional beliefs and all these traditional stories um, and reapplying them to contemporary life um, in w ways that are both really familiar and really alien. And, and I think that, that gives his work uh, a certain kind of power. And uh, so, so you came in basically at the script stage, and uh, then the producers were, uh, I think, looking um, uh, at cast and so on. How did you get? How do you get involved in that? And I know I'm, um, I'm not going to name any names. So. Yeah, we uh, we often get very heavily involved in casting as a company. Um, you know, that's that's a role we fill a lot, being an American-based company that does a lot of international film. Um, I will say casting is by far my least favorite part of this process. Uh, casting is a horror show, um, particularly when you're dealing with the major American agencies because you've got at least three or four conflicting agendas at any given time and you have no idea if people are telling you the truth or not. Um, you know, we're in a position where being there, at least they have to lie to our faces. Um, which do you want to <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine. Um, this this was a painful pro casting process, and and some of that was the nature of casting. Some was some things that happened um, on the producing side and on the financing side. Uh, there was a bit of a thing that happened behind the scenes that made it more difficult than it would normally need to be. Um, which I probably can't talk about on record. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was it was difficult, uh, and it took a while. Um, but it's not uncommon. Like we went through three or four really significant casting permutations uh, on this. Mm. Uh, the The initial piece of cast that attached was Mackenzie Davis. Mm. Um, you know, as the female lead, and she's like super hot, up and comer. Um, you know, and then we had Chris Abbott join. Mm. Um, kind of in the process of getting the male lead on. Mackenzie got offered uh, a very major part in the, the most recent Terminator film. Um, so she left to go do Terminator. Um, Chris is where we had the issues that I probably shouldn't get into in any detail. Um, Chris ended up leaving. So suddenly we had a film that at that point was actually already financed, but now we yeah. didn't have our cast. And you pre-sold a lot of it? Yeah, we, yeah. we, they, we had pre-sold very, very well off yeah. of that Mackenzie Davis, Chris Abbott combo. Um, then Imogen came in, uh, who we had worked with. I think this is either our third or fourth film with Imogen. Uh, we've worked with her a bunch and she's amazing. If you have the yeah. chance to put Imogen puts in your film, put Imogen in your film. Um, yeah, she's, she's interesting because she goes always from like very sweet roles like Jane Eyre. Yeah. And then she goes into like horror. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She's, yeah. she's really Thank gifted and she's completely mm -hmm. fearless and she is lovely to work with. Um, she's just a really quality human being. So Imogen came in and then we had Toby Kebbell on for, for a beat. Mm -hmm. I don't remember why Toby left. And when that dropped out and we were getting kind of tight on our timeline, Imogen was like, well, I just did this movie with Jesse Eisenberg and we yeah. really had a lot of fun together. Can I just call Jesse? Uh, and we said, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, and then Jesse Eisenberg came on and we were in this weird, that's the only time I've ever experienced this. Usually when casts start slipping, you end up moving down kind of the value list. Uh, mm -hmm. We ended up in a spot where we had the most difficult casting process. We had one of the most difficult ones we'd ever had. Uh, and we came out the other end of it and we moved all of our numbers up. Yeah. Which was, <laughs> um, which was strange. Yeah. So the buyers were happy. Buyers were very happy <laughs> in that case, yeah. Yeah. And um, I was just wondering, for you as a co-producer, when you came on board, I mean, you knew Brandon um, mm -hmm. and Fantastic Films and so on. But uh, so what was your part in it? What, uh, what did you contribute to the co-production? I think a lot of things. I mean, when we came quite late on board, but still, I mean, we were still 
a little bit involved in the in the script process? It's always like when you're a co-producer, you can come with with thoughts, but you you should never like expect that they will take them. But we we uh, was I think we just got a, quite a nice relationship with Lorcan and and a lot of the things that that we suggested was actually like being ended up in the film. So so both creatively and and of course like then we helped finance the film, which meant that that it could apply for Uromarche, and um, and and yeah, we got that as well. So it, it was like. From like ticking boxes, it was like a very success story for our little company, Ping Pong Film, since we like co-production, yes, Uromage, yes, can, yes. I mean, it, it, it's really hard not to yeah. be very proud. And hands on, well, what, what is it that you that you did? Like, what was your part in the co-production? Sorry. I was like, just going to say, I mean, yeah. you guys yeah. were really instrumental in the look yeah. of it. Like the way the way that Yonder looks has a lot to do with Denmark. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and kind of your involvement in post and VFX and. I mean, the the, the VFX was was like, and it is like quite a big amount of VFX in this film. Not like, uh, but yeah, all the building of of the of the of Yonder, the the suburban area. That was uh, a Danish VFX supervisor, Peter Yort, who orchestrated that, and. We like worked in a triangle with with uh, Belgium and Denmark, uh, with VFX companies in both places. We ended up also have a little bit of VFX from Canada and a little bit from Ireland as well. But that wasn't really the idea in the beginning, because it just everything grew at a point. So so we so that's what that was one of the things Denmark contributed with the other thing, which I also think is quite important for the for the tone of the film was it's a Danish composer. Uh, and also sound designer who, who made yeah both sound design and composed the film, um, which also like bring in, added to the tone and and all those guys were more or less handpicked by Lorcan, because he he had really did his homework uh, and 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 really like okay if I'm gonna work with Denmark I would really like to work with him and her and him so it was it was and then we just yeah helped that happen. Make that happen. Yeah. Cool. So, so when uh, well, it's quite atypical actually to have a genre film that is, I think, that is not only publicly financed, which of course we now had an example before, which was Canadian, mm -hmm. um, because there was a lot of public money in it, uh, both on the Irish side, on from the Danish Film Institute side, then there was public money from Belgium in it as well. Um, but on top of that, you actually get like what is uh, seen a little bit like the stamp of like a European art house film, which is this Arimash co-production funding. So this is really like because it was elevated horror uh, with a fantastic script. Um, but on top of that, then you end up um, being um, selected for an A festival. So um, normally week. here mm -hmm. in Scandinavia, which is different than in other countries because the Scandinavian film institutes have the festival rights to the films, um, our um, staff at the institute is normally quite involved in um, you know, talking to the festivals as well, placing them and so on. Mm -hmm. But in this case, it's... Um, it's the sales agent yeah, and the yeah. producers and, and, doing work. And a lot, so of, a lot of that falls specifically to me um, yeah. because, because I have a history in, in programming. So uh, within XYZ, typically we plan and kind of do the legwork on all of the premier territories uh, in terms of what the launch is for the festivals. And then we work with an agency that handles kind of everything from that point. Mm -hmm. Once we've done our continental premieres, we, we hand it off. Um, and yeah, the, I mean, in terms of placing genre film, historically it has been a little harder, but that has actually changed quite a lot uh, in, in recent years. Um, you know, really the last of the A festivals that has had a strong bias against genre was Berlin, um, but that is, at least what they're saying is that has changed with the changing of the team there. Uh, the, the previous creative director of Berlin quite outspokenly disliked genre film and just wouldn't program it. And he, and he would say that on, on record um, and did say that on record <laughs> repeatedly. Um, so for the most part, we never even tried to go to Berlin. Um, but in Cannes, uh, the last couple of teams um, at Directors Fortnite in particular have been quite genre friendly. Um, you know, Critics Week 
is is a little trickier to read. They're not opposed to genre film, but they definitely have a certain lane that they like to stay in, in terms of what type of genre film they like. Mm -hmm. uh, but you'll you'll often see one or two genre films in Critics Week, um, you know. And Can does also have kind of the midnight selection in the main selection, which is very very limited. Um, you know, but we uh, we were also involved in in Joe Penna's film Arctic, which starred Mads Mikkelsen, which played Midnight in in Cannes. Um, so that happens as well. Um, Toronto obviously is very very well known for the Midnight Madness section, but then mm -hmm. we'll also spread um, genre film through the rest of the selection. Uh, so this year in Toronto, we had five films there, and that included the first three nights of the Midnight selection. And then one film in special presentations, which is normally one of the bigger, kind of more artier driven sections, and one in contemporary world cinema. Um, Sundance has a dedicated midnight selection, as well as an openness to putting elsewhere. Um, Venice is more open in the sidebars than they are in the main selection, but there's definitely spaces there as well. So how did, um, so when did you hear that? Uh that you were selected for can was it a quite last minute? No, and it did was... you kind of ex it, it, was it a bit unexpected? So, um, and, and I would how, and for you like I would say I would say I would say it was unexpected that it was that it was Critics Week. Mm. Mm. Um, you know, we we have a, a pretty decent history with directors Fortnite. We've we've shown several films in Fortnite, um, and and in a few cases we've had films our, our American titles that have premiered done world premiere in Sundance and then moved to Fortnite. Mm. Um, you know, we did that with Mandy, we did that with Bushwick. We've, that's happened a few times for us. Um, so we, we all kind of thought that was the more likely one. Mm. Um, and then right at the beginning of their programming process, uh, Remy, the head of Critics Week, came back to us very quickly and they were absolutely in love with it. Mm. Um, and to us, that was actually part of the appeal um, because it's outside of the program that people expect to get the genre stuff in can. Um, so it feels like it's a, a more special curated sort of thing. Um, they gave us, they, they told us immediately what time slot we were gonna get, which mm -hmm. day we were gonna be on. Um, they gave us one of the real marquee spots. Like they, they gave us good real estate um, and stuff. And so it was, it was a very easy decision for us to say yes to it. Um, and it worked, because we were the film in Critics Week that really stood out. Mm -hmm. um, there was kind of us, and then most of the rest of the selection, other than the animated film, which is amazing, uh, yeah, that they had yeah, that year. Yeah. Um, you know, but the rest of the selection really felt quite similar to each other. You'd look at them and say, yeah, clearly this is all the same selecting team. Um, and, and you could see that play a little bit in, in the way the press went. Um, and yeah, and that's, that's all part of the game is, is figuring out, um, I mean, you want the laurels for sure that helps, but it's also about placement. It's what day of the week are you going to be on? If you're in any major festival, if you're later than the fourth day of the festival, just nobody's going to see you because on day five, everybody's flying out. Um, so if you're, if you're going to get a late selection at an earlier festival versus an earlier selection at a festival that's later in the calendar, you wait, um, you know, because that makes a really significant difference. Um, and then there are, within the really bigger festivals, there's certain programs that definitely have much more impact than others. Um, and there's, there's a lot of time and energy that goes into knowing who are the curators, who are the people that are making these decisions, um, how do they like to be approached, uh, when do they like to be approached? What sort of material will and won't they look at? I think it's really easy um, for a producer, certainly for kind of the general public, you kind of look at it and you say that there's some sort of objective process to, to festival programming. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, kind of certainly can likes the narrative of these are the best films made of in the year. It's not true. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a completely subjective process. Um, and everybody has their own taste. Every festival has political pressure and economic pressure and certain types of things that they have to select for reasons that have nothing to do with, with 
kind of what has come in. Um, I knew a guy, a film that we weren't involved with, but I knew a guy once who was in sequence rejected from Toronto, Sundance, Tribeca, South by Southwest, Fantasia, which is a genre festival in Canada that had premiered every single short film he'd ever made. Um, and what else? Fantastic Fest. There were at least one or two other rejections in there. Um, and then he premiered in Venice. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, it's this crazy thing where it's like really on a certain level, you just, you need to find the right person. And in many cases, it is one right person in terms of how you do it. Um, and sometimes it's as simple as that. For us, there have been other times where, um, where there's been a lot of planning into it. When we, when we were launching The Raid, as an example, um, you know, that's a film where we knew always where we wanted to launch it um, because it's a martial arts film, it's a new talent. Um, if you're doing that, you want to do that in Toronto. Uh, Toronto is who launched Tony Jaa and Ong Bak. It's kind of Donnie Yen's revival, who's now one of the biggest stars in the world. All of that was keyed out of Toronto selections. Uh, and there's one programmer in particular who we needed. He's not there anymore. It's a guy named Colin Geddes. Um, and Colin I've known for a while. Um, and we were in this particular situation where we knew the movie was going to be done for the festival. Um, but it was going to just be done for the festival, <laughs> that we were quite raw all the way along. And Colin, I knew, because just because I'd known him, that he wouldn't, in his time there, he refused to watch promos or trailers uh, or anything. He would not watch anything until he had a cut, and he would watch it once. Mm. Um, and so we're like, well, how do we get this on his radar? Because if it's gonna happen at all, we're not gonna be able to show it to him until like middle of July. And most years in Toronto, they have selected already in July. And we're like, when we do that thing in July, um, what's going to be temp Foley, if any Foley, which really matters in an action movie. Um, and so we're like, we have to find a way around this um, and make sure that he's seeing something and planning for it, or else all the slots are going to be filled before we're even able to show him. Um, and what we ultimately did um, at that time, he was also programming uh, an action movie only film festival that happened in, in, in North Carolina. Um, and the, the, that whole team's previous film was a film called Marantau that had won that festival the year before. And, and so what we did um, was we took footage from the set that we dummied up as a thank you to the festival uh, for the award. Um, <laughs> You know, so we did a sequence. If you've seen the film, there's this very long one take fight sequence of him going down a hallway and he takes out about 15, 18 people in, in the course of that fight. Um, and so we started this reel with the kind of the camera pushing, kind of the thing ends. You hear, you hear the director called cut. And we didn't include the action, but the director calls cut. And then Eco looks up, he's like, well, hey, Action Fest, this, this, is, this is me. Thank you so much for the award last year. I wish I could be there, but I wasn't. Um, and now I'm on set of kind of the new film. And as he's doing this, the camera is pulling back. So you just see just this increasing level of destruction in the hallway and bodies everywhere and blood sprays and, and just all the consequences of what he's just done. Um, and for us, it was great because it was a first piece uh, kind of a footage out there to let everybody know the new movie was coming uh, in a way that didn't spoil anything. Um, but it also meant that our first piece of PR also branded this other event that this programmer we needed was working for. Um, so it was very, very good for them. And it meant that no matter what, he was going to watch this thing um, because they were going to show it at the festival. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, so it was a way for us just to find a way of knowing kind of what his taste was and what his work process was. It's like, okay, how can we respect his work process, but also make sure that we are present enough that we have a chance? Um, and so that, that sort of stuff happens a lot. I think um, we are shortly going to be wrapping this part of the session so that we can open up for questions. But before we do that, I, I just think that you both have um, a lot of experience doing um, genre films in different ways. So if you had to come up with a couple of dozen don'ts um, that you would say you highly recommend to people, and maybe in your case, since you know so many different industries and you know the, 
Nordic one really well. Mm. Maybe you can come up with something that you think you've seen this done before in the Nordic countries. Don't do this. I hate it. Or you think that is really done really well and this is really something to, you know, take note of. Um, um, I mean, the most common thing like to not do that happens specifically in kind of the American industry, UK industry, parts of Europe um, is people that grew up in the home video era kind of make tribute movies uh, to their to their the favorite things that they loved, like their little cult movies. Um, don't do that. Um, you're, you're form your own voice, first of all, um, rather than just throwing back to something else. I don't need a tour through your through your VHS library. I've seen all those films, too. <laughs> um, and if I want to watch them, I'll just go watch them. I won't watch your version of it dominantly. But the bigger thing is all of those kind of VHS cult titles, um, they were created in a marketplace that doesn't exist. Um, if that's the movie you're trying to make, you're just not going to, uh, cause you're not going to be able to finance it, uh, unless you want to make it for about $300,000. Um, so that's, that's a really common era. I get pitched stuff all the time where it's like, well, this is, kind of my, like an update of Reanimator, like, I, which I've been pitched like three of those in the last year. I was like, don't make that movie. Like, you'll never make the movie. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, what about you, at, uh, Alexander? What did you learn in the process of doing movies yourself or maybe just because in the co-production with Vivarium, was there anything you say like, well, this is something I took with me as a positive or this is something I took with me as I'm not going to do this again. <laughs> I think there's a lot of things. Um, what I learned, whatever. I mean, there's a lot of things I learned, but but also just like never having a conference call with 16 people at the same time <laughs> run by a lawyer. I mean, I learned a lot from XYC and, and your colleague, uh, Maxime, because yeah. he also always started the conference call saying, I only have half an hour which was very brilliant because then he said whatever he wanted to say and then he left. I should have yeah, figured that out in the beginning <laughs> instead of staying up for, for conference call. With, yeah, with that seems good that way. And it was very brilliant. <laughs> uh, very good. But, but, but what I want to say with that is that just like sometimes when you are involved in a co-production, a lot of, of, the, of the power all of a sudden is given to, to lawyers and, and banks who are discussing when people should get what money at what time. And it's very, I mean, of course it's necessary, but it's just very boring. Uh, and I think a lot of things could just have been solved with producers and uh, sales agents. Um, that's like one learning I took for that, but that's very like technical producer kind of like thing. Uh, but also just like finding interesting people to work with. I mean, that's, that's basically what I think it's all about. I mean, I have a great relationship with, with, the, with the Irish producer. Now I have a good relationship with the Belgian producer and, and finding nice guys to work with. Or, you hate or girls. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's... <laughs> no, just, <laughs> so, so that's just... I think that is the, the, the most important thing. And also in, in this time where I think a lot of producers have just figured out that, oh, there's money in Shanga films and they want to produce Shanga films without really like having any love for it. I think that is kind of, it's very easy to, to say or, or to tell when people are doing it from a, a, a more like, I want to make a, a, a model and in, in this model and this slate, I want to put those elements in because then it would work because I've seen somebody else do it. And, and that will very- That's a good, that's a really good point. I mean, the genre audience, part of why it works yeah. kind of in the market is that it's an intensely motivated audience uh, and they love the new thing and they seek it out. Um, but the, the, the flip side of that is you cannot fake it with that audience. No. <laughs> uh, they, they will know. Yeah, and very, very quickly. Yeah. And uh, you know when Vivarium is coming to um, Denmark, to the... Uh, I'm just looking at... Where was it? Wasn't there someone from Angel Film here? Ah! Yeah. Yeah. Oh, all the way down there. When will it come out? Now, I think it'll, it'll like... Uh, f uh, spring? Spring. spring uh, I know Should that the, the... We have to wait for the US premiere, which is in March. Yeah, uh, just push 11 or 12th, I can't remember. I think it's the 11th. Yeah, something like that. So we, we'll have to wait for that because there's a whole pack against that. And then I think the idea is it will come out pretty soon after, in the spring, early summer. Well, then I'd like to thank um, 
Todd and Alexander for um, talking to us. And again, we're going to have questions now, but uh, I'd also like to thank um, the people who were not in the room with us, which were the producers, um, the Irish producers, Brenda mm -hmm. McCarthy and John McDonnell, who were not able to come. Um, and then, and of course, there's also the other producers of the film, but also, also just because there has been a lot been talking about Greenland, and I know that they ins were very insistent on this being streamed. So I'm going to say thank you to Emile Peronard uh, for suggesting the streaming, but also say hello to Aga Hansen, Nina Jakobsen, Malik Kleist, and Inuk Silasu. So um, I hope, guys, you see this. And there is somebody who I'm sure um, I'm going to punk to get in touch with you. Anyway, thanks um, for this.